I would now like to invite my esteemed colleague, Professor June Arima, Senior Policy Fellow, Iria, to, to deliver a presentation on the contribution of a low carbon energy transition to carbon neutrality in the ASEAN region. Professor Arima, the floor is yours. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, good morning. And it is a great pleasure for me uh, to present a scene setting uh, for uh, this uh, EAF4, uh, namely Carbon Neutrality in ASEAN uh, background uh, presentation. And uh, this is an excerpt of um, Paris Agreement. And in the Article 2, uh, Paris Agreement aims at holding an increase in the global average temperature to well below 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and pursuing efforts to limit uh, the trans uh, temperature increase to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. And to this end, in the Article 4, uh, it says that a party aims to reach global peating of green, uh, global greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible, so as to achieve a balance between anthropogenic emissions by sources and removals by sinks of greenhouse gases in the second half of this century. So this means carbon neutrality in the second half of this century. And uh, with this in mind, uh, the UNEP, United Nations Environmental Program, is annually publishing so-called GAP report. And according to the most recent one, uh, it says that uh, in order to achieve two degrees Celsius target, uh, at the time of 2030, uh, there's a gap between uh, the, um, the current pathway, uh, global emission pathway, and desirable pathway for achieving two degrees target. And that gap is 12 to 15 gigaton. Uh, that means uh, uh, 12 billion tons uh, to 15 billion tons. So uh, the countries are required uh, to raise uh, the NDC in total uh, more 12 to 15 degree, uh, billion tons. And in order to achieve 1.5 degrees Celsius target, then the gap will further expand uh, to 29 to 32 gigatons. Uh, that's a very much massive gap uh, because uh, the total Chinese emission is about 10 gigaton. So uh, that requires three China uh, total emissions uh, to reach uh, the 1.5 degrees pathway by 2030. And this is a very much tall order. And uh, I think uh, there is a growing trend in the world uh, to encourage uh, 2050 carbon neutrality and also 1.5 degrees Celsius target despite the fact that Paris Agreement is not necessarily uh, pushing 1.5 2050 carbon neutrality, but uh, this is a growing trend. And at the time of uh, September 2019, about two years ago, uh, still uh, the number of the countries uh, which have announced 2050 carbon neutrality was rather limited. But in uh, 2020, uh, the number of the countries for, has further expanded and uh, though China is not colored red here, but uh, China has also announced uh, the carbon neutrality target by 2060. So uh, I think uh, the majority of the countries are now have announced uh, somehow the carbon neutrality target either 2050 or 2060. Today, uh, we heard uh, the presentation by Indonesia minister that uh, Indonesia is aiming at 2060 carbon neutrality. So I think uh, the coverage of uh, the countries who have announced, which have announced carbon neutrality target is now expanding. And uh, with that in mind, uh, the IEA has presented very interesting report, uh, net zero emission by 2050 in this May. And uh, in order to give a picture of uh, energy mix, uh, which is, uh, <clears throat> which would be necessary uh, for achieving uh, global uh, carbon neutrality by 2050. And uh, it says that, uh, you know, the country, number of the countries which has uh, newly or updated uh, NDCs are now between 70 or 80 countries. So, and um, uh, while the 
countries who have committed net zero emissions have uh, exceeded 100. So it is uh, approaching to 130 or 140 countries. And uh, the coverage of the CO2 emissions uh, of countries which have announced uh, net zero emission target is uh, between 70-72% uh, of the uh, global uh, total emissions. But uh, the, according to the IEA's analysis, uh, this announcement will still not be sufficient uh, for achieving 2050 carbon neutrality. And uh, the blue line uh, accounts for uh, so-called steps, uh, the scenario of, uh, say, uh, the current uh, policy scenarios. And APC uh, stands for Announced Policy uh, Case. And that includes carbon neutrality uh, announcement. But uh, even taking into account uh, the most recent announcement by such country as US, EU, and China, um, the expected uh, greenhouse gas emissions at the time of 2050 is still 20 gigaton or over. So uh, this means uh, the countries are required uh, to put forward even more ambitious target, a long-term target, and uh, that means uh, they are also required uh, to present uh, more ambitious NDCs. And uh, in the scenario of carbon neutrality by 2050, uh, the IEA considers that uh, the, in order to achieve global uh, net zero emission, a uh, developed country uh, need to decarbonize uh, their energy systems or the whole economy even before 2050. So uh, between uh, 2040 uh, and early 2040s, uh, they are required uh, to achieve net zero emissions, advanced economies. And as for emerging market and developing economies, uh, they will need to uh, start decreasing uh, their emissions immediately uh, from now up until uh, 2050 and a little bit beyond 2050. And uh, looking at packet to CO2 emissions, uh, the, now uh, the packet to emission of the advanced economy is much higher than that of the emerging and developing economies, but they are going to converge uh, towards 2050, uh, 2040 and 50 uh, towards uh, zero emissions per capita. And under that situation, uh, the uh, electricity sector uh, in the uh, left column, uh, you can see the blue lines. Uh, electricity sector uh, will mark the most uh, rapid, uh, say, decarbonization uh, towards 2040. By 2040, uh, global CO2 emissions from uh, power sector will be completely zero, while uh, the other sectors, such as uh, transport and industry, uh, that will take time. And uh, that could be very much difficult to completely decarbonize uh, even by 2050. So uh, that means uh, we need uh, net negative emission technologies uh, for neutralize uh, zero emissions by 2050. And uh, in a uh, net zero emission scenario by 2050, uh, the share of uh, the total primary energy supply, uh, you will see uh, almost 80% of uh, the uh, <clears throat> total, uh, uh, total primary energy supply uh, comes from non-fossil fuel energy, uh, including renewable and also uh, the nuclear. And uh, the share of fossil fuel uh, will be uh, reduced from 80% in 2020 to just over 20% uh, in 2050. So uh, that means uh, this uh, still 20% uh, uh, share of fossil fuel uh, needs to be neutralized by developing uh, CCUS technologies and also uh, the negative emission technologies. And uh, from now to 2030, um, the mainly uh, wind and solar and bioenergy and electrification and so energy efficiency will be the key policies uh, for reducing emissions from 2020 to 2030. And uh, taking into account uh, the activity level, uh, under the business as usual scenario, uh, 
the total emissions is expected to increase by 24%, but in order to offset uh, that increase and further reduce uh, the emissions, you need to mobilize uh, such technologies as wind and solar, bioenergy, electrification, and also energy efficiency. And from 2030 to 2050, and in order to completely decarbonize 2050, and uh, at the same time, uh, you know, given uh, the economic growth and also uh, resultant uh, the activity growth, the under the business as usual scenario, emissions could increase uh, from 2030 to 2050 by 51 percent. But uh, you know, you need to decarbonize, so therefore uh, you need to mobilize even more, um, say, innovative technologies such as CCUS and also hydrogen uh, technologies needs to be uh, mobilized. And in addition, uh, behavioral change and avoided demand uh, needs to play a bigger role uh, from 2030 to 2050. So this means uh, innovative technologies is a key uh, for uh, complete decarbonization uh, towards 2050. And uh, fossil fuel production uh, is projected to decrease uh, substantially from now to 2050. And in particular, uh, the production of coal uh, will be uh, much, much lower and uh, almost, say, uh, eliminated uh, by now to, uh, from now to 2050, while uh, the production of natural gas is to be also decreased, but uh, the decreasing pace uh, will be, uh, say, milder uh, compared with coal. And uh, if a uh, world energy uh, system is to be decarbonized uh, by 2050, uh, then uh, that means you will not need additional uh, greenfield oil and natural gas investment uh, from now to 2050. Only uh, the uh, investment for existing field uh, would be needed. So that is assessment of the IEA. But uh, you know we need some caution uh, in assessing this table because uh, this uh, required investment is underpinned by complete decarbonization by 2050. But uh, there is still a lot of uncertainty about uh, the feasibility of complete decarbonization by 2050. And if there is a continuous demand for uh, fossil fuels, such as oil and natural gas, then if there is no new investment from now to 2050, then uh, there could be a supply crunch. So uh, this uh, table, uh, this figure, uh, needs to have some uh, needs to be uh, seen with some caveat. And uh, in the power generation system by 2050, obviously uh, the share of um, solar and wind will substantially increase. And uh, looking at uh, the share of uh, these technologies in 2050, that accounts for almost 70 percent of the total power generation. And uh, in addition, uh, fossil fuel with CCUS and also um, you know, hydropower and also uh, nuclear uh, will play a role. So uh, in total, uh, the power generation uh, will be completely decarbonized uh, by 2040, uh, 2050 and also uh, even much earlier. And uh, this is some picture presented by the IEA for the whole world. But as uh, presented by several ministers, including Secretary General and also Brunei Minister and other ministers, uh, the, we need to look at uh, the country specific and also regional specific circumstances. And uh, looking at uh, global CO2 emissions, uh, Asia is uh, without question and the driving force of incremental or CO2 emissions from now to 2050. And uh, looking at uh, each country in Asia in the right column, uh, though China will see uh, the peak out by 2030, but uh, under the business as usual case, India and ASEAN uh, will continue to grow uh, their CO2 emissions. So how to say uh, reach a peak out and also start decreasing uh, their CO2 emissions, that is a big uh, question and a big challenge. And uh, this is um, uh, area's uh, most recent outlook. 
And it shows that uh, in line with rapid economic growth, energy demand in our sense will continue to expand very much sharply. And even under the APS alternative policy scenario, uh, which includes ambitious energy saving targets and also renewable energy targets, and primary energy demand still grows 2.2 times by 2050. And uh, current energy system, uh, fossil fuel make up almost 80% of the primary energy mix for ASEAN region uh, in uh, the uh, base case and also even under the APS. So this is not at all compatible with Paris Agreement and ASEAN countries are parties uh, to the Paris Agreement so uh, they are also uh, required uh, to contribute uh, to the ultimate objective of the Paris Agreement, which is aiming at, uh, you know, the uh, stabilizing temperature rise well below uh, two degrees, and so for achieving a global carbon neutrality uh, towards the second half of this century. The challenge is uh, climate change is uh, very much important, but it is not uh, the only objectives uh, faced by the member states. And uh, this is a comparison of the uh, priority uh, among uh, major countries and regions. And uh, the looking at, uh, for example, the case of Sweden, uh, where uh, Greta Thunberg is coming, uh, the climate action is obviously the number one priority among 17 SDGs. And Japan, uh, climate action is, uh, has the third highest priority among 17 SDGs. But uh, looking at uh, China, uh, the priority on climate action is 15th out of 17. And for ASEAN, a total, uh, the climate change comes six uh, priorities. And uh, the first priority is education, and second priority is healthcare, and the third one is no poverty, and the fourth one is job, and the fifth one is clean water. So uh, the climate change is not necessarily uh, the highest priority among member countries. And also uh, looking at uh, individual uh, countries, uh, the priority for climate action in, uh, is uh, between uh, four, five, six, and there is no uh, number one uh, priority in the ASEAN member countries. And even in uh, Singapore, uh, of which uh, GDP per capita is the highest among ASEAN member countries, uh, still climate action uh, has the fourth uh, priorities. So uh, there is clearly a difference of the priority among countries, uh, developed and developing countries, and there is um, a difference even among ASEAN member states, uh, perhaps uh, in accordance with the difference of economic development stage. So <clears throat> reflecting that a different priority, uh, recently uh, we have observed that uh, there has been uh, some gap between uh, this, uh, the messages uh, which came from G7 and G20. In the G7, uh, there was a very much ambitious statement uh, concerning the, their commitments, collective commitments uh, to 2050 uh, carbon neutrality and also 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius target. And uh, looking at the language uh, from G20, uh, they repeat uh, the language of the Paris Agreement and not necessarily uh, say uh, singling out uh, the temperature target of 1.5 degrees and there is no reference uh, to the 2050 carbon neutrality. It rather says you know the, uh, the carbon neutrality uh, in the second half of this century. So that is identical language with Paris Agreement. So uh, that shows that uh, while developed country, uh, including G7 or OECD countries, are aiming at 1.5 degrees target and also 2050 carbon neutrality, and this ambitious narrative are not necessarily completely shared uh, by non uh, by emerging economies or developing countries, and uh, as repeatedly pointed out by many ministers. Uh, the carbon neutrality goals uh, need to be pursued, but uh, that pathway uh, could be different across the countries and most notably between developed and developing countries. So uh, the challenges is, um, you know, availability, accessibility, and affordability of energy supply 
is the most fundamental requirement、uh, for the ASEAN countries.、Uh, that is a unanimous message we have heard today、uh, by opening statement and also keynote speeches by ministers. And in the business as usual scenarios, ASEAN region will continue to depend on fossil fuels. And、uh, we have heard very much encouraging、uh, statement by many, many ministers that、uh, countries are making best efforts、uh, for reducing the share of fossil fuels and also eventually,、uh, say, phasing out、uh, some coal,、uh, you know, inefficient coal power plants, and also、uh, for longer term,、uh, the、uh, phasing out of completely for,、uh, coal power plant.、Uh, that is very much en- encouraging messages. But I think uh, that uh, time frame could be di- different from country to country. And、um, uh, the, as I said, Paris Agreement uh, target uh, will also bind ASEAN countries. So they need to make an utmost effort、uh, to pursue a low carbon energy transition, aiming at carbon neutrality in the second half of the century. But pathways towards carbon neutrality could be diverse among countries. And one size does not fit all. Each country's specific national circumstances must be taken into account, and the decarbonization pathway needs to ensure other policy objectives, namely availability and accessibility and affordability. And looking at、uh, you know, the high priority is given to、uh, poverty eradication or、uh, education or healthcare or others.、Uh, All which needs、uh, substantial financial resources. Therefore, affordability、uh, strongly matters in this region. So,、uh, to this end, all the options、uh, for low carbon energy transition、uh, towards decarbonization should be explored. So, that is why、uh, technology opti- optimal approach would be needed、uh, for minimizing cost、uh, for achieving carbon neutrality. And in today's session, Uh, we are going to discuss the role of natural gas and、uh, variable renewables, and the role of CCUS and hydrogen. And also,、uh, we will discuss、uh, the ASEAN carbon neutrality scenarios. And、uh, I think all of them are some sort of component、uh, for achieving carbon neutrality in the ASEAN region. And I very much expect、uh, the active discussion today. So, thank you very much for your attention.、Uh, that ends my presentation. Thank you, Professor Arima, for providing the overview and setting the stage for today's discussions. You've raised very important issues regarding affordability, availability, and accessibility, as well as the issue of different levels of priorita- prioritization of climate change. One size does not fit all, and technology is key for carbon neutrality.